Friends, welcome back to the Film Alchemist Podcast, the show where we look at movies we love, break them apart, to find out what gives them their magic. I'm your host, Josh Griffey, joined as always by my ghost-faced, movie-loving, voice-altering prank caller and co-host, Alex Dandino. Yes, that's me. Yeah, that's that. I mean, that's a good summation. You don't want to jump in too much and start unmasking before we get in, guys. That's a great. That's a great intro, Griffy. <laughs> Would you like to play intro game, Griffy? <laughs> All right, guys. As always, uh, please take a second, leave us a rating and review, especially if you're listening on Apple Podcasts. That helps us out enormously. Uh, we appreciate those of you who have been doing that lately. Thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts. You can also see our faces along with hear our voices on our YouTube channel, Nerd Alchemist, plural with an S at the end. Uh, you can email the show, filmalchemistpod at gmail.com with ideas uh, of movies you'd like to see covered, themes, guests, double features, anything like that. We want to hear from you. Also Maybe on that, that note. Find us on all your socials. Uh, we're there. You're there. Let's get it on. Let's get it on and talk about movie stuff. Uh, but that's it, guys. All right. Today, we are back. Uh, this October, right? Every October, the show goes full buck wild into the depths, the unfathomable uh, abyss, the obsidian abyss of the whole genre. Right? So we got a lot of great stuff coming for you. Every single day this month, a new horror flick. Um, obviously, the big secrets out of the bag. Our, our mega series for this month is Halloween. So that'll be very excited. Uh, stay tuned for that. But right now, we're starting the month off with Scream. Um, Alex, Scream 2. Scream 2. We're, let, let's dive right in. Uh, to preface, we will be doing the where this ranks among the best horror movie sequels or number twos at the end of the show but okay. i think i'm gonna spoil it a hair to say this is a really fucking good sequel <laughs> yeah uh, this is my this what is my about this sequel movie. works so much for you i think it's the one upmanship like it's the one upmanship in the face of again we talked about this on the last pod like the meta of the movies themselves is so complicated and i think the tightrope walk you have to do is so difficult in the first one, the having to do it again in a sequel mm -hmm. makes it even more complicated because essentially what's going on now is the get like the bag of tricks is out. Everyone knows what's in the bag. So what you have to do is make it more interesting again. So to me, this is a great sequel for two reasons mainly is one, it still does a good job of taking itself seriously. It takes its premise seriously in that it doesn't go too deep into what you could call probably caricature to the point where you're like kind of taken out of the story. You're not taken out because you still want to know who the killer is. I want to know who's doing all this again. I thought this was over just when you thought you could go back again. There's a great, there's a great episode of the office where Michael Scott says, I feel like Nev Campbell and scream too. She thought she could go to college and just hang out with her friends. And then the killer came back. I learned a lot of lessons from that movie. That is, is that is a, that is a that is a great touchstone for anyone watching this film. Everyone should learn their lessons. But the second thing I love the most about Scream Two is the reveal because it is a fantastic, like Jason Voorhees level reveal that's so much fun, and you're just like, oh shit, that is fucking great. Like the cleverness yeah. of the reveal itself of the actual bad guy makes me like this movie even more because it's justified it's fascinating it's worthwhile and again nobody is the wiser for it it's really 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 good and you kind of see it coming because again they do the same thing they did in the first one with billy and stew but <laughs> you also are just like not paying attention because the movie's having so much fun with your uh sort of misdirection it's cool yes they do a good job of again they set us up where and one of the fun things about the Scream series is that the characters kind of talk in theses, right? So every character, oh, yeah. everything they say is a dissection of their culture, the world. So a lot of this is taking the piss out of college stereotypes, sorority life, this and that. Um, what I think is really fun, though, is that they still are able to use the exact same weaponry of the first movie, which yes. is 
Like a great example. Like this movie does a great job at introducing Cotton Weary into the story, right? God bless. And he's God so bless good, right? Schreiber, by but, the way. but what it is is you start watching it, and there are just these moments where you're like, "It can't be Cotton Weary. That would be so on the fucking nose <laughs> that the guy who got off is." But then you you start thinking, right? And this is the the brilliant part of the movie. I would argue, I have a little beef with the reveal in this one, right? Because I figured it out. Immediately, the very first scene I could have figured it out, I did. I knew there was going to be some kind of end around, right? Like there had to be another thing because you're like Ghostface is six foot three or whatever, but uh, you know who I know it is is not. So there was like there is still some some clever uh, trickery going on. What I really like this is the movie where Ghostface becomes kind of more interesting in canonization, right? Because yeah. I think Ghostface kind of rightfully is put way down on the best slasher character list. Because oftentimes it's people working in tandem. They're bitch-ass high school students. You know, a lot of, like, real wussy white guys are Ghostface, right? A lot of wussy white guys. And so we go a through this lot. cycle, right? Where you're like, this isn't... Ghostface himself is not really scary. The fight choreography is really bad a lot of times. You're like, look at Ghostface just sucking at his job. But yeah. what this does, and what I think this movie solidifies that makes Scream so amazing and Ghostface so amazing, is that it it gets into this curse mentality, right? That through our obsession with tragedy and murder and uh, you know kind of enjoying other people's misery, there is this infectious nature. These people, these broken, horrible people, are pulled, you know, into this gravitational pull of evil. And that's what this movie really solidifies. And it, it it carries out, obviously, still throughout the Scream series. And I think that was a really important addition to this movie. Yeah. I mean, I actually think the... And then, the, actually, something else that I love that my wife noted while we were watching this is the thing that makes this movie even better is how tolerable it is to watch Nev Campbell go through this again. Because, again, like... Sydney Prescott is not like she's just being it's not like Sydney Prescott's being an idiot. Like I think that's a really important thing. Like it's not just this like flagrant it's like this flagrant violation of her own like personal rules of like, well, I'm just gonna go to college and fuck around and be a dumbass. Like she's actually very guarded and <laughs> she has caller ID. The first time we see her is someone trying to prank call her. She literally looks at her caller ID, she goes, Hey asshole, you're a dumbass. Yeah. Like, a literal callback from the opening scene where we hear Star 69 is ass. <laughs> right. And like it's a really important thing for your especially for your final girl if she's going to actually last through these movies to be your final girl to uh, to learn from her mistakes and to learn from things and I think that's the thing I like the most and why Nev Campbell is in fact my, one of my all-time favorite final girls. Why she's second to no, you know, maybe Lord, to second to Laurie Strode is that she learns from the previous movie and does not take other chances she doesn't consistently she's not super bad until like you know number three is a little weird but like this well, one think, is a very i think but it, this one's a great example three, they lay the groundwork right to yes. where if you were going to make an argument to me that sydney prescott is the best final girl of all time i think the meat of where you make that argument lies in uh two and maybe the open of three right uh you know the yeah. job she does after and this and that there is a mm -hmm. scene in this because that's it. I was just like, Nev Campbell was such an absolute perfect lightning bolt moment for this franchise. But there, and I love too, because they even open when we first kind of see her, right? They have her with all these sorority girls that look very much like the cast of 80 slasher movies. And yeah. she's just, you know, kind of rebuffing them, and I don't need anyone. I'm cool. But she's still got a boyfriend, so she's not. You know, I mean, yeah, she fits really well into the world. She's a strong woman who's finding her way. There's a scene, though, when we Sydney realizes what's going on, right? I'm, I'm trying to remember the exact context, but there is a, a murder, right? Or not a murder. This is what happens when, uh, when her boyfriend gets jumped by Ghostface, right? Yeah. And Connell gets his arm slashed, and Dewey's, you know, fucking limping around, <laughs> whatever he's doing in this movie. <laughs> Doofy. Yeah, Doof Doofy's got a severed nerve, so all of a sudden he has a T-Rex arm, and he's, like, still trying to, like, whoop people's ass. I don't know. Do Dewey in this movie, 
went a little extra for me at times. But I really love Dewey, so I'm not here to just like throw haymakers. I, I do too. But but it's it's moment, still hard to imagine Doofy survives this movie. That's right, Doofy. I'm still going with Doofy. Doofy. Just existing period in this series after part is it's wild because that what they do with Doofy the rest of the series is he just walks into police stations and does police shit. <laughs> Yeah, I think, yeah. <laughs> but it's, no, a, it's amazing. The to scene me. I want to get Sorry, to though. Get, get to your point. The, the get to Sydney your point. The Prescott moment where I was like, "This is the argument." That's the scene I would show. This is Sydney, right? That, and then her working at the call center in three. When she looks and she sees, and the fucking weight, right? There's been another murder across the street, and the weight of what's happening, and there is this beautifully done push in, right on Nev Campbell's face. Is the realization hits that this is continuing and that she is going to be at the center of it. I mean, I, I watched it and I was just like, you just don't get lucky enough to have that good of a performance in a lot of horror movies. No. You know, a lot of horror no, movies, true. they cast unknowns, they cast younger actresses, this and that. But in that one moment, I was like, she just told you an entire emotional cascade, right? Uh, a dam being undone, right? And the flood of everything that's coming while maintaining strength and stoicism. I was like, that scene right there was fucking, and also being like, am I fucking another killer? Right? There's a lot going on in that scene, and she just crushed A lot going it. on in her head. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, I mean, it's one of those great, it is one of those great moments that just solidifies why this is the right choice for a final girl. Why this is, why she's the star of the movie. And yeah, well, she has that line at the end, too, right? Where it's, you forgot one thing about Billy Loomis. I fucking killed him. And I was like, yeah, fuck yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, you just you want to rage with Sid. You're like, yeah, I'll I'll follow you all the way. I, I, having been rewatching the screams, and we're about to rewatch Halloween, so it's kind of fitting. I didn't even think about it as like a best final girl contest, but she. I mean, I think too is where you see this this real ascension factor. Uh, yeah. I actually want to jump back for a moment. Yeah, this is my favorite opening in the horror in the Scream series, right? <laughs> Because everyone right. talks about the opening of Scream 1 as this iconic, you know, it caught us off guard. Drew Barrymore got <laughs> But I think the opening to Scream 2 it's amazing. is its own, it's its own Banana Republic microcosm <laughs> of why yeah. this movie so – like, I watched that opening, and I just remember I, – I had to re-watch the first X amount in the movie theater because I just kept writing questions down. I just wrote so many fucking questions down. Because one, I mean, because one, they're they're at stab, right? Right. They're kind of dissecting uh, stab and going at you know it's just white people getting killed by white people. Blah blah. blah. I want to see Sandra Bullock only if she naked hot. And I was like, all right, I'm in. I'm with you. Once we enter that theater, it becomes this fucking theater of the absurd. You know yeah. what I mean? It's it's like because <laughs> one, the studio just the most blatant murder porn of all time the studio is handing out getaway outfits yeah right encouraging the fucking uh rainbow knife so you wouldn't really be that weirded out if you saw a real knife so the studio is just clearly giving people the tools and saying hey watch this would you like to be the murderer and then yeah. i'm completely convinced that that creepy concessionist just put so much cocaine in every snack at that bar because you go into the theater and it is it's a nuts. literal wild madhouse. It's bonkers. And not I don't only understand. that, people just keep walking in and out of the theater like it's more of like a hangout, like you're just moseying well, by. This, so they're so wildly reminds, excited for Stab that they're not. Not only that, Stab. but then like the movie, yeah, the movie starts and like the movie begins. The lights go down and like when you're in movie theaters in general, even excited theaters, nobody like starts screaming when the lights go down. Only like, gigantic assholes. Right, only, only gigantic assholes, and apparently asshole every like gigantic that. asshole is in this movie theater because the lights go down, and not only are they all like screaming and whooping and hollering, but everyone with a ghost face like Kit is literally just like yeah, and like stabbing the air yeah. and shit. And I'm like, good lord, like, yeah, this like what <laughs> like it's like the studio wanted them to come out like so the interviews be like, how was the movie? Like all the reporters like, how was the movie? Like, oh my gosh, the best way I said. Yeah, I mean the, co the cocaine definitely was a part of it. That's just there's no logical explanation for what's happening unless we're also None. taking in this. This becomes this ring style like paranormal experience where when you see stab it activates your inner angry white man. <laughs> it just sends you into a fucking 
glorious rage at the screen. It's it's wild. But even past that, right? The 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 scene in the bathroom even is very interesting to me, right? Because you yeah. got the Omar Epp scenario. He goes in and there's two ghost face like co peeing that won't move. So I'm like, already this is a very strange, like, what? Is this some eyes wide shut bathroom shit? Who knows? He goes into the bathroom and just starts hearing, oh, I'll tell him what I did, mommy. Oh, mommy, mommy, I'll show him what I did. Because I had the captions on so I could actually, like, read what yeah. the fuck was being said. Which I feel like, again, that's that's a dead giveaway, right? Like, yes. Because <laughs> I remember figuring it out the first time I saw the movie. If you watch it with the captions, you're like, this is 1,000%. Yeah. Like, this is Voorhees. Up front. Again, they do a good job of literally telling you all the things you need to know to move forward yeah. with the knowledge that this person is like with the knowledge that Mrs. Loomis is the killer of this film. And yet and Timothy Oliphant, of course. And then but yeah, if you ha- again, if you have kids, you watch movies with captions because they're either screaming or they're sleeping. Yep. So you have no option. So like we watch it, we watch everything with subtitles now, and so I'm watching this with the captions. I thought the same thing. I saw that line, and even Andrea was like, "Oh, it's definitely Mrs. Loomis." Now I'm like, I never even knew what they were saying. I just yeah. assumed they were like. I honestly thought they were just fucking. Well, that I thought was always it was going to be some other lady, right? I didn't know Mrs. Loomis immediately, but also there's this weird. <laughs> it's such a funny setup because I was like, "So are the two other little ghost face in on this?" Were they intentionally just blocking those urinals? How long did she stay in there? She just assumed he was going to piss. Right? Like, just straight up assumed that he had to come to the bathroom. Because I mean, later we get of... into this, like, wildly complicated, she's killing people who share one name with the victim. <laughs> from what's I mean, from... So again, I like, it's a really, insane. it's a very, like, <laughs> again, it's a very, like, inanely clever way to completely misdirect what's going on. Like, okay. The only thing you really would know, and what's good, and again, this movie does such a good job, for by that being the case, like, oh, it's one name. Oh, they're going in order of the kills. Okay, cool. Literally never comes up again. Because in that's if that's the case, you should be going in order of who's, and they should be like chasing down like who right. the next person that was killed was. Uh, and also, that's just their assumption, right? So they can throw it in sure. our brains, because this is what the movie does well. Is it, but then it also it dimes out every single evidence. character. Yes. yes. They're always giving you these little red herrings, right? To where, hey, if you uh, miss this and then you get the reveal wrong, you'll feel like a fool. So we're right. over analyzing constantly. Yeah, I just I thought it was so strange. The kill was good, you know. It's like <laughs> it's just a wild setup in general. But I uh, actually really liked Jada Pinkett's death, right? Because this is something Scream does exceptionally well, which is there is this wild, especially in this fucking, you know where the wild things are theater with these coked up white people just watching stab and getting fucking revved up. Just totally, just fully torqued watching Heather Graham get murdered. Absolutely torqued. Right. And I like too, that when the white killer comes back, he now also has his mask on, right? <laughs> he, he has to blend in with the herd of other whites, but it's so strange. But when they do this though, this reality of we're so wrapped up in the violence and murder on screen and when we see it in life, we're desensitized to the point that we yes. don't even accept the reality of it. And we totally. think it's also just part of the entertainment for us in the theater. Yeah. That's that's one of those you get the kill you need, right? You need your bigger body count and more blood and more elaborate, as they say in the scene. But it's also one of those good snipes that, you know, what Scream does is it's it's partially reflecting back at us, right? Yeah. Like I always make the joke, well, yeah. right? Like Scream is kind of that. When you accidentally, you know, see your reflection in the phone when you're jerking off and you're like, oh, like what's that thing? Oh, yeah, God, I'm, I'm going to really, go right. I'm not going to do it. And it's hideous. Scream, and that's scream what this for me. <laughs> yeah. Scre- all the screams are some version of a funhouse mirror of when they were made. That's yes. like the benefit of these movies. And again, that's what's so kind of deceptively, but not deceptively. It's just what's brilliant about the scream, genre, the scream franchise in general is that the cracked mirror or funhouse mirror or whatever you want to call it of these movies is that they are completely meant to cap like time capsule when they came out. Like right. this one came out, what was it? Two years after a year or two after Yeah. like this perfectly encapsulates what people loved the most about the first scream. 
and what frightened people. And then when we talk about Scream 3, we can get into exactly like that movie came out at a very specific time and it's reflected in the in the movie itself. So, again, <laughs> the meta the meta of the meta narrative is very fascinating and not and again, it's very difficult to make those kinds of things not distracting. Like you are stopping short of someone breaking the fourth wall and turning to the camera. So by not doing that, you're keeping people engaged in the story besides just like, cause really a lesser filmmaker would have Randy like Zach Morris, this shit and stop the entire movie to talk about movies. And the fact that we don't <laughs> is wonderful by the way, but making it part of the general narrative is what works very well. And that's what continues to work for scream Two is that, you change the setting, you give your characters a couple of years to age up, but you don't make them the same person. You give them the general you give them the general knowledge of the first one and let them improve upon their original story. The only person who like seems to not learn any lessons is Dewey. Like obviously he should not be running around. See, but, I, I you know. think Dewey does learn. I would say Gail. Because <laughs> Gail just comes well, in straight up and she's like, Hey, what's up? I still suck. <laughs> I'm real mean to people. Well, I feel like Gail <laughs> Gail Weathers Gail Weathers' character to me, but across the movies, never really learns a lesson. Gail no. always comes in hot, always ready for something, and right. literally almost constantly always almost dies. Well, she There's, is I think she's always our lens from the exploitative media, right? So totally. Gail always is there and she I think she shows sympathy when it can help her. Right. And when she like, that's the thing. I don't ever truly buy any of the her and Dewey moments because that's I'm like, I think she really is having this cathartic. Oh, maybe I'll just marry small town Dewey and he can T-Rex around our house and it'll be great. Or is she like, hey, we got to get this job done so I can get the next book out. You know, (laughs) so I mean, yeah, yeah, but Gail never, ever seems to have a real. And, And that's that's actually kind of a. A credit to Courtney Cox's performance, right? Is she is yeah. always captivating and fun to watch, while completely refusing to seemingly ever take any of this in and be like, "I, I got to do better. Like I can do much better." No, yeah, she <laughs> never, she never learns from anything. Like, and again, I, to me, yeah, like Dewey, I think always is one of like Dewey has a more practical reason not to engage because he literally can't walk properly anymore because of the first time this all happened. Right. But that's what's cool. Dewey's the man to prove that he can still get the job. The fact that he's willing to do it makes him heroic. Right. The fact that he's willing to do it makes him somewhat heroic. Gail never learns because nothing bad ever happens to her. Like she's never really in any like actual danger. No one ever tries to actually, she, I mean, she gets gets murdered. Shot. (laughs) Oh, by the way, (laughs) <laughs> you've never been I you've mean, never had a bullet bounce off your rib in the screen movies you, does that even matter you no do one, not have the street cred of a gale weathers to be throwing such accusations no one ever dies from a gut shot in screen movies ever <laughs> yeah there's a lot of uh <laughs> there's a lot of but that's kind of a fun extra thing in scream is you're like until i see them cremated i'm assuming this person could come back <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> uh yeah i thought because they, it's so funny because they, they really do run. And I think that's a cool thing, too, is they're showing, like, the sequel issue, right? They're running exactly the same playbook. Is O'Connell the guy? But they keep giving us these great breadcrumbs of who could be the guy. Again, right. I think one of my beefs with the movie, if I had a big beef with this, I love Lori Metcalf. Great addition to the movie. She's awesome. And that final scene when she just has her wild eyes and she's snapped. So good. So dude. good. She's amazing. But this this gets back. There's this other movie, uh, The Black Coat's Daughter, right? It's a popular kind of mm-hmm. small horror movie. Yeah. It's a great movie that I really enjoy until they get to this finale where you're like, I have to be so stupid to imagine the series of events that would allow this to happen. Right? Kind of a, how do you not recognize this person? For me to assume that Gail Weathers, super reporter, who's been investigating this book on Billy Loomis, right? Writing about the boy, the teenage boy who killed her and blah, blah, blah. Didn't have a chapter about Billy Loomis and his family being broken up. And she's never seen a fucking picture of Mama Loomis? 
Mama Loomis was never interviewed on the TV shows like every other fucking person. <laughs> like, are you? F- I know what Jeffrey well, Dahmer's parents look like. Are you fucking kidding me? Well, also, okay. Well, they do I the line. That. It's I like, did... oh, it's sixty pounds and some work. And I was like, right, all, all right. Again, th- they try to give her the out by that because you're like, because again, she, it's not like she doesn't recognize her. It's that she goes, oh, that's she's very different from what I saw in photos. No, no, no. Yes, no. I agree. Sydney recognizes her. Right. And so I was like, if Sydney recognizes her, then she's not like completely face offing. Right? Like, well, Gail Sydney not recogni- knowing who she is, is insane. No, 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 no. Gail interacts Sydney, with her four or five times. Sydney recognizing her makes sense. Gail yeah. not recognizing her. Gail, Gail not recognizing her makes more sense because she's not as close to the action. But again, it's. Yes, I agree. It is like a huge hole in yeah. what you would otherwise assume would be a reporter's reference. Right. A part of a reporter's thing is to make sure she actually interviews the people. I mean, you can make a. I can come up with anything. I could. I could explain it away and say. Sure, but um, I mean, I think that's one of the cool things. It's one of those things that I just saw and I was like, because they even mention in sequels it gets more elaborate. This and that, you know. <laughs> they they let you know really early that there's two killers. So. Right. I didn't figure out who the second person was going to be, right? Because I was like, of course they're not going to use the Billy knockoff, right? Like, no <laughs> fucking way. And, of course, no, they no. did it. And you're like, damn. But her, I figured, because I was like, why does she keep talking to this lady reporter over and over? You're like, of course, it has to be that one. And it's just like, I just wish they would have done. If you're going to go that weird and do the big Lifetime movie reveal, say yeah. something crazy. Say, like, I went to, you know, I went to Thailand and got my entire face redone. I look like a new woman. The woman my man would have wanted. You know, like, you know, just add that one extra line in. That's all they had to do. There's no fucking I, way that Gail Weathers does not know what Billy Loomis's mother looks like. I don't care how much fucking weight she lost. Again, yeah, but you can, I mean, I could explain it in a way where that Gail is, the idea is that Gail considers herself a great reporter and perhaps she is not as good. You sure. can make that. A, I sure. could make that assumption that she is a short-sighted reporter and that she would not research that portion of the Woodsboro murder story. Right. Granted, but there's no also play- a gaggle of reporters around her at all times. Yeah. One of them I'm has not, to be a good reporter. <laughs> do they? I believe our current climate would speak otherwise. Um, <laughs> I think. <laughs> let me let me put it this way: Would I want Laurie Metcalf to not be in the movie to address this issue? Absolutely not. Lori Metcalf adds more to this movie than the no one knowing what Billy Loomis's mom <coughs> flaw is, right? I'm totally down, but I just it struck me in a movie that's so tight and so reflective that this just feels like a really dumb one to miss. I wondered if there was something extra going on and it just didn't click with me. I if mean, they made me, it that about, that absurd for a reason. I mean, that is to me always the thing when I watch scream movies is that yeah. the absurdity, the absurdity is what's supposed to win. In my opinion, you're never supposed like when we're watching these movies and we're analyzing them and trying to like figure out who the killer is and actually get through this mystery and try to solve it before our characters do the importance. Of, Cause it, great example, CC Cooper's death, which is Sarah Michelle Geller in the movie is yes. bar none. The most bonkers, ridiculous murder scene of all time in a movie. She is. We chased just up watched the, the garage door murder. This is she. <laughs> we she, we just watched the garage door murder, which is awesome. And awesome. this is Sarah Michelle Geller's murder is she gets chased up the stairs while throwing things down the stairs, which is like, and not only like things, not just like she's not throwing like heavy vases or anything. She's literally throwing like bicycles, things that can be avoided. <laughs> <laughs> like there's absolutely not like. They do the exact same thing in Scream 3, and at least there, there's stuff that's heavy and could actually hurt. Like, she is not throwing anything that's an obstacle. But that's not an absurd... I did note, I was like, this... it is That scene is interesting you brought it up, because my note on that scene was, one, I like that they went back into the cameo, like, get bigger name actresses to have these one-offs. I thought that was Well, cool. the whole... I mean, the, the by the way, Windsor we had College Graham, might as well... Tori Spelling... Windsor College might as well be called uh, like CW University or the WB <laughs> University because like the entirety of the cast of every one of those shows was in the fucking movie. Yeah, right. <laughs> I think but what I liked I think about that the only person who didn't show was fucking James Vanderbeek. That's true. He was probably in there somewhere. <laughs> he was one of the Ghostface extras. 
But yeah, when she killed uh, Cece, though, I was like, oh, this version of Ghostface is way more brutal. Like, well, yeah, remember no. we talked about in Scream 1, the first time when we see Drew Barrymore killed, there's kind of a slow, like, figuring out where to aim before the murder. Mm -hmm. I mean, granted, then she ends up in a tree gutted. So I guess right. it's hard to make the argument, like, more hardcore. But it was just, it was very brutal and fast kill. You know what I mean? Yeah. I Well, and to me, again, like, I'm not saying the ending of her death was not horribly brutal. Because, yes, I agree. Like, getting stabbed and thrown off the top of a building, not great. <laughs> but the hijinks getting to that were very, like, Looney Tunesy. And to me, like, that is something that the Scream movies do very well without, like, yes. overdoing it. Without, because, like, they parodied, it, they parodied it in a scary movie as well. Yeah. And... That could be the thing that's burned in my brain, but at the same time, it's also one of those things where I look at that and I'm like, there's an ampage here that I'm not sure I necessarily qualify. The end, yes, but getting her up there takes considerable effort with like, again, she's like the worst murder victim ever. She's just like, she's throwing like Nerf but, balls. It's but so bad. that lady has had that, that woman character has been murdered in that way a thousand times in of you course. know these movies. So. Sure. I get it. Again, Scream, one of the things I guess you could argue it doesn't do well is the fighting and action. The choreography yeah. of like people fighting is always madness in yeah. these movies. Ghostface but I think might that's be kind one of on of purpose. The... Yeah, I mean, I've always assumed that the reason Ghostface is like the most uncoordinated person in the history of horror movies <laughs> is because he's wearing like He's wearing a mask that he can't see out. They're wearing a mask that he can't see out of very well. And I, I guess robes. Like, again, it makes you really wonder how the fuck uh, Brutus rolled up to Julius Caesar and actually was able to pull something off. Because I got to tell you, man. Well, like, no, he just kind of sauntered time. up and stabbed him in the back. Yeah. <laughs> you can't be doing all these athletic moves and high kicks and shit. Gotta yeah, I got to say, Ghost Ghostface might be the least athletic uh, well, no, of he's all got serial a killers thing, in like, robe. That's If he had a dress on, dude. Like, I used to. Like Romans, they used to have like sundresses, essentially. That's what a toga is. It's like a sundress setup. So you, as long as your knees aren't hampered, you still got the right. hey, hey. You know what I mean? You can still throw it from the hip. But it's just like the amount of flailing that goes on from Ghostface is just like yes. I, every time. Like he always is falling over stuff. Every yes. time. Every no, but house he's, he chases he's very people much a cartoon. He's yeah. very much a cartoon caricature. But, and I then, think but that this movie always ends that goofy bullshit. In a really hardcore murder. The murders are right. brutal in this. Well, and that was the thing I loved about... Uh, it was, the, like, again, this is a great example. Randy says it in the movie when he explains the rules, but I love the amp up here when her and her friend are in the backseat of the, the cop car and they're on yeah. their way and the cops get murdered. That scene where Nev Campbell and her friend have to crawl over, like, a knocked-out ghost face. Yeah. God, dude. What a great scene of like something that should be completely innocuous and probably cut out of a movie yeah. because everyone would sit in the theater and go, come on, he wouldn't have woken up. Like yeah. take that the mask to me. Off. Yeah, you're screaming at the TV. Take the mask off. Like We were I was all just, Jada Pinkett Smith in that moment, screaming at the TV. <laughs> loved it. Loved it, dude. dude I love that you scene. You forgot, though, the craziest part of that scene is the cop who gets his the cop fucking the head fucking, impaled. Oh, my God. And when yes. they come back on that absolute fucking nightmare fuel uh, effect, <sighs> he's still twitching. Like yeah, his the, body's arm, still, the hand twitch. Oh, my God. That is, to me, so that is the coolest like horror moment in the Scream series. That is so Absolutely. fucking good. I thought oh, that was it, insane. <laughs> oh, no. That, uh, I'll that tell you one the is scene awesome. that really jumped out to me that I loved. I love uh I loved Sydney's play. I was really into the play <laughs> of Sydney being cast and essentially birthed by ancient golem clay faces. Yeah. I that mean, birthed Sydney's... her and for her to not be like just a little on the nose, maybe not yeah. and her the drama teacher Sydney... just being like, I get it, some things are going on with you, but I don't have an understanding. <laughs> But I, I like that, that visual amp up, though. That was really fun. Yeah. And it leads to a perfect place to have our finale, right? But I, that moment was great. No, it was great set. Good, great set piece, great use of the set piece. Because, like, there's no reason to show us that she's a, what, dance and theater major or whatever, which is a weird choice for someone who's literally trying to not get murdered on a regular basis. But, <laughs> like, 
that was a great piece of set to have for the end yes. of the movie itself. And then, yeah, I absolutely love uh, the uh, the scientist from Secret of the Ooze telling her, hey, <laughs> just, uh, just give me a break here. <laughs> the smart, cultured, everyman uh, character actor, yes. <laughs> but it was so I have to, I have to learn so that guy's good, name. But in that moment, too, in that moment, something really interesting dawned on me, right? Because her detectives are in the room. Right. But Ghostface still could have killed her so easily, right? Yeah. My question, I, this is when I realized Sydney has some form of story armor, right? So the killer in that moment, I'm assuming that would be Mickey who was in Ghostface at that moment, knows that he is not to kill Sydney yet, right? And I think that leads to and explains away why Sydney is willing to climb over Ghostface in, again, one of those classically dumb horror movie things. It's because I think, in a way, Sydney begins to sense that she has some Wait, kind you... of armor, right? She she is now seeing this whole thing as a play. Are you sa- wait? Are you saying that? Are you saying that you the ghost face that she sees when she's rehearsing is real? Oh, absolutely. Oh, I have always harbored on the assumptions she saw that. Well, she's, okay, she's so having... there's there's one of two things. There's one she sees it, but then I'm like, mm-hmm. why do we see him like run off? Like, you know, characteristically, not athletically run away from the stage. Right. (laughs) But on the flip side, the counter to my argument is when did Ghostface learn all the choreography and dancing (laughs) for this moment? Well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, to me, this is again, and it's interesting because Mickey's also an obsessive art kid. Maybe he could have learned the choreography. But I mean, the thing that I the reason I like that it's a vision, too, is because it builds on what we end up getting from Scream 3 as well. If this is something that is a repeated motif for Sydney, Sydney is continually having visions of things she does not want to see or she does not want to address. Okay. So, like, her deciding to, A, be a theater and dance major, B, star in this play where she's being chased by people in masks the entire time no, she's for the being big fucking by finale. Them. That's the thing. She's being birthed by them. Whatever. But Sydney Prescott never, was born from Men in Mask. But if that's the case, then, which is fine. Wh- I mean, <laughs> to me, the psychosis of seeing things that are not there is a really important aspect of Sydney Prescott's development as a character anyways. Because right. what it does, especially in three, is actually motivate her in a lot of it ways. Is the, which great, is the great addition of part three is that. I don't yeah. think there's any other elements of that in this one. So I don't. Well, to me, I'm I choosing assume, to. I've never assumed that the ghost face in that scene was an actual ghost face. Then why wasn't he just gone? Why did we see him like stage left? <laughs> so like, why would you? Away. Why wouldn't you just assume that that's Sydney's vision? That's the whole point. She's an unreliable narrator in that moment because she's starting to see things. Sydney the idea is imagines that he's, him jogging off, though, instead of just vanishing. Or just like a crowd I mean, of golem mask, you know, that aren't Ghostface above her. I don't know. I, I'd be interested, Alchemist. What do you think, man? Yeah, I'm going. I mean, I'm going real moment. I my theory again, is that I it explains away why Sydney a does a couple dumb things at the end because she realizes she has story armor. She has import. Sure. I mean, yeah. I don't know. It's possible. I personally, I don't know. It's possible. I'm not saying it's impossible. There's nothing impossible, especially. It's weird. I guess. Subjective- yeah, you're saying you never thought it was real. I never assumed it would be a vision, which is weird because I assume everything in movies is a lie. <laughs> I always assumed she was imagining what she was seeing because, again, it's a it's a matter of a developing psychosis. Like she right. has ha- she has had like for one, she also a lot of the times you get to hear you she hears voices that kind of stuff like there's nothing about what's happening to her that is normal so why wouldn't she be thinking maybe why wouldn't she just have a vision of her tormentor coming for her again weird choice to want to actually star in this thing where people are running around you in masks well it's cool for us to watch it's visually very fun we watch sydney the the final girl right be born in form and caught in this you know, stage play, right? So it's it's this really cool symbolic moment for what is happening to her in this movie. Because Sydney right. at the end of part one is like, well, that was a tragic whoops-a-daisy, right? One scorned boyfriend and his fucking moron friend. Uh, you know, what are the odds? Whoops-a-daisy. 
in this right. second one, not only do we canonize that Ghostface is not himself like this big scary killer, but he is this this great drawing evil, right? Like essentially the he is the monolith in two thousand one, but for evil white people, right? Yeah. That's what Ghostface becomes, and I think that's really cool. In a similar way, we see that somehow something about Sydney does this as well, right? It, it gets this kind of bigger feel, which which I like. And, you know, we do see her uh, start to go down this. You know, it, it's possible. It's possible. Um, What did you make of the cast in this one? I thought, again, really good cast. I thought it was Strong hard cast. to recast as good as the first one. They did a really good job in this one. Yeah, I mean, I think when you're... <laughs> When you're in college, you're trying to mix it up. Uh, still a lot of white people in college. Um, again, I, I I liked that it was not. I'm, I liked that we weren't just doing a repeat of the cast in general. Um, I liked that it was a slim main cast too. Like for me, the first scream is a big ensemble. Yeah, and this one was much more much more tightly knit. It's basically Nev Campbell, her friend, who the name escapes me right now, uh, Randy Meeks. Uh, Randy Meeks and then uh, David Arquette and, and, and then Dewey and Dewey and Gale. Like, that's pretty much it. Like, those are the main players throughout the entire movie. Like, you don't really have... And they're also all on the same hunt the entire time. Like, for me, Scream is a lot... Of, the first Scream is a lot about convergence of narrative because, like, Gale could give a shit about the survival <laughs> of these kids. Gale wants the story. Yeah, probably Dewey, the opposite. <laughs> Dewey is trying to keep her Dewey, Dewey's trying to keep people safe and all the kids are just trying to party except for obviously Stu and Billy who are trying to murder murder uh, and Sydney party Prescott. Moody murder and party he saved the murder this, for after the this the one has a really <laughs> centralized narrative and again like there's plenty of like famous people that pop up in the movie like yeah. Jerry O'Connell's a great addition like he's pretty one note like again he's a frat guy there's really nothing else he to say also about him. has one of the more horrifying moments in the movie Definitely. When he's like, my girlfriend's being targeted by a murderer. People are dying at college, but she top might gun. she might fancy two detectives. So I'm just going to top gun and walk on people's, you know, put my dirty shoes on the tables where people eat their food and put make my it dirty, all about me. <laughs> put my dirty penny loafers, which, by the way, yeah. could they have given him a worse like look for the entire movie? <laughs> He, I mean, he's, just, he's a handsome devil, but if you're asking me, I already had sex with a killer once who <laughs> used me putting him in jail for the killer that he would become uh, as a lever with which to pry me open and get sex out of me, right? Yeah. Jerry O'Connell having the same where he's supposed to be the good guy by the end. It's like, I never would have done anything to hurt you. It's like, well, you were manipulating me because you wanted yeah. to make a big fucking show tune out of it. You did say, hey, can we still have kisses? And- Instead of being like, hey, you're going to give it. me a fucking necklace. <laughs> yeah. You're, hey, I'm going through some stuff, man. Can you back the fuck off? Can you back off? Just go do push ups and wear button up shirts somewhere else. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah. A lot Let of me tucked fucking button ups. Mourn. Why? Yeah. You're in that, college, that dude. That is essentially you... his two notes, right? Is he sees her talk to any, like, he sees her run up to Dewey and is like, hmm. hmm. And I'm like, what? Fucking Dewey's limping around like Igor. No way. Like, what is happening? Jerry, yeah, o- but I, that's again, Jerry O'Connell has to be the we think he's the killer guy. I think Jerry O'Connell's character is just super insecure that he's dressed like a dad at a 4th of July barbecue yeah. all the time. That's that's like, a look, though, constantly. at that age. Believe it or not, that's a look. Uh, I actually thought Cotton Weary was the superstar edition. Oh, hell yeah. The way See, this is the Leah thing Schreiber love. plays him is so good. And actually, it's, it's one of the things that bothers me about Scream is I think he got did dirty in Scream 3. I think Scream Definitely. 3 benefits a lot if Cotton has a better run. Because well, what have, he does again, is this great brill- – I mean, it's it's so fun. We'll get to, we'll get to like, what it – we'll get to what Scream 3 did to Cotton. But right. to me, <laughs> yeah, like, he has this great runway in the movie itself, and I fucking love how – like, he, again, he gets the hero ending. It's fun, man. I love that. Like, yeah. I like the redemption – I like the redemptive quality of Cotton Weary because – He's obviously kind of a dick. Yeah. Pretty much. But that's what I mean. I don't know if I'd call it redemptive, right? Because when he shows up well, and he's like, hi, Sydney, I'm just here to clear the air. <laughs> You're like, oh, that's not. That's not right. Oh, no. I mean the ending, not his beginning. Right. That was but a I'm saying idea. that scene in the library when he's just like, it's Diane fucking Sawyer. Like, 
forget Gail. We need to, I need this. You owe this to me. And he starts fucking losing. I was like, oh, look at this guy. And then he's, you know, tough talking the cops. And right. I was like, what a great drop. And even killer. in his very last moment, right? Because, again, we do that. He has bloody hands. We think he's a killer. His mm-hmm. last moment is he has a gun, right? Is, is uh, you know, the unrecognizable mama, mama has a fucking knife to <laughs> Sid's throat. And he's like, I'll kill you or I'll save you if you now do a verbal contract for Diane Sawyer. So it's such a piece of shit move. I love it. And at the end, Sydney's even like, oh, there's the hero. And he, what does he do? He's like, there's a time and a place and a price. Here's my card. <laughs> but and he's like, not, it's such a fucking, because that's the thing. He's not really a redemptive hero. But right? it's redemption. I love that. But it's redemptive in the cotton weary fashion. Like to me, what it right, is, is, right, right. it's, it's redemptive for Sydney because she gets to right a wrong for one. Yep. Uh, but and more importantly, give that shine away at the end. She essentially is that's saying, what I was about to say. Final girl, that's I'm the most out. important thing is that she literally says, "Great, I don't have to deal with this yeah. ever again because he's now the person." Like that, I think is probably the most important aspect of the whole thing. Yeah. Is that Sydney literally gives, like you said, gives the shine away, and it's impressive because every it. other fucking character seems obsessed with it obsessed and she's just that's like what no makes, man right that's that that's is makes her, her so final great. girl armor right because she does break the you know drinking and sex i think so it's like you know that is her thing is that she has this nobility but yeah, yeah. I, I just i thought it was cool because if you make cotton come back and just be this straight up hero it's like yeah. i mean we already know he's a you know no. he's out we there need- fucking slinging dong to married ladies yeah you know we need the cotton weary that to, like, banged out this thing, so but I think it's a really cool spot they find where it's, you know, just again the, the, I think the enemy of not, my enemy, right? <laughs> I think him not being the scumbag with a heart of gold is probably the best part about the Cotton yeah. Weary story is that, but that he's that, that's still... That's what I mean, though. That, that nailing that landing of, I could save you. <laughs> but, again, it's... It's such a fine tightrope to walk, and that's my favorite part about Cotton Weary is that he's still the same guy who's laying pipe to Maureen Prescott. Like it that never changed. Yeah. Like he totally banged that lady. Yeah. Like that's, I think is the most important thing is you never forget that he definitely fucked Sydney's mom. Yeah. But he's got his, he's, he's got a price like everyone else. Like that's the best part. <laughs> but that, I, I like, cause it, Gail gets away with this too. I, I do like in scream where they don't feel the need to, give people these hero moments all the time. Like some people oh, are no, just great. kind of scumbags. I mean, and he that's plays the best it. Like part I love after makes he them shoots real. her and he's just like, Oh, that was intense. <laughs> it's like, he's just such a, cause it's, he doesn't have an enormous amount of screen time, but I feel like cotton weary is a very well fleshed out character in my mind. Like, yes. I feel like I perfectly understand this guy from these awesome it's, choices. Liam I Schreiber's think it's made. to the credit. <laughs> It's to the credit of Liev Schreiber that we're able to understand Cotton Weary so well. And again, yeah. he's a character who has maybe a sum total of like, I don't know, what do you think? Like 15 minutes of screen time throughout three movies? Oh, maybe. I, I would say that's probably even too much, yeah. I mean, I guess he gets I, like five minutes in the next one, but yeah. Yeah, so I mean, like to me, Cotton Weary, I was spread out 15 minutes over three movies. Liev Schreiber makes a fucking feast out yeah. of this character which he always and the does fact that, he's one of the best and the fact that we remember that character so well as opposed to like him be like because to me billy loomis is important because he's the first killer but yeah. i mean billy loomis is billy loomis and Stu are still very one note even though they are played masterfully and again no no discrediting my man matthew lillard he is amazing no. but they are still just like those characters. This guy survived three movies, and I know everything about well, him that I need to know. Well, he didn't survive three movies, but he was in three movies. <laughs> he got to be in all three. That is In the Scream universe, that is survival, my friend. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I... It's just... it's But those are the little choices that Scream makes that just separate... I mean, it's just... It's, it's a really clever addition to that ending scene, right? Instead yeah. of him popping up out of nowhere and doing it, adding that little beat is just fascinating. Um, I would say it's perfect. Oliphant didn't do it for me in this at all. Nothing you about know, him personally. Just no. that the Mickey being part of the killer, because they add this really cool idea that I wish they would have gone in on a little. Right. And I actually think it's kind of what Scream 3 maybe in some way attempts to do, which is Mickey 
She has that weird line where she's like, there's only 97 active serial killers, and I got a young one on the rise. I'm like, no, no, uh, I don't like that. But I do like his idea of he's like, he's more stoked. He's like, I want to get caught. I'm different. I want to get caught, and I want to put movies on trial. Well, I think think that's that's the that's a cool thing that obviously when we'll talk about Scream 3 and some of the issues it faced became a really big real world narrative that well, the question I have about it, too, is one, they didn't do anything with it because Mickey just exists. Right. He's not really putting movies on trial, but also it feels weird that he's the guy who wants to put horror movies on trial. Well, what's really interesting? Well, again, like this is his motivation. Like and this is the thing that I love the most about. Laurie Metcalf in this movie. Like yeah. Mrs. Loomis is a world-class manipulator because yeah. this is like his whole shtick. Like he gives this big long-winded speech about putting movies on trial, all this other shit, like the kind of stuff that we're used to from this movie. Yeah. And then she literally shoots him in the head or shoots him in the chest. And she's like, did you hear that crazy shit? Yeah. Fuck How'd that you cat. buy that for a motor? But that's what I like too. Cause, but I thought the idea, but of, that's great because it I literally want is to get caught to be put on trial. No, is a really that is a cool idea, right? This becoming famous through infamy beat. Yeah. Well, I it's a great it was idea. Cool and it just kind of like evaporated. That's fine. To me, like, again, I think that's a great idea. And it gives that character a decent motivation without, like, just making him, like, well, I like to stab so much. I decided to participate. Like, that's, yeah, right. like, the important thing. <laughs> like, it gives him a reason you knew to something exist. Something else was coming, right? Because we had already seen, like, him sneak in when she's on the phone at the sorority. So like, you knew there were two. My, it, that was the thing. I, was like, I felt like there was a, another, I felt like they could have played a different card to be honest. They could have, but I mean like, again, he gets shot like within five seconds of revealing his motivation. So it almost yeah. means nothing anyways. Like but rewatching means the some- series, I keep being struck by the thought that there are two very obvious people to have under the hood that they never got to. And it's Dewey and Sydney's dad, right? There's just yeah. There's there's underlying. I mean, Sydney's dad more for part three, but he could have been in here too. His life was also ruined by all this, you know. Yeah. So, but even Dewey like coming back and just be, <laughs> he took everything from me. Now all I see is the face, but you know, and he he does the Kaiser Soze, but with his arm where he's like, <laughs> and then just a full <laughs> flowing ass arm that would. <laughs> I don't know. I just I felt like Mickey was just kind of like shoehorned in because they'd be like, no one will suspect that we're going to do Billy part two. <laughs> I mean, again, it was it made sense. It didn't bother me as much. I mean, Timothy Oliphant in the movie is creepy enough anyways, because this is right around the time he like this was in the late 90s. So he's doing like go. He's not yeah. the hero in a lot of movies. No, he's like the bad guy in a lot yeah. of like the first movie I ever saw Timothy Oliphant in was was go where he's an ecstasy dealer. Yeah, that's like the first thing I remember him from, and he's always been that person for me forever. <laughs> no matter what he does, he's that even creepy. In ter- yeah, even Just in Deadwood, I'm like, where's the drugs? Where's that dude slang an X, man? No, <laughs> I, I, X. I'm not saying this is an affront to Oliphant. Not I, at all. It's so weird because I think this movie. We'll wrap up on our sequel discussion, right? I think this movie is so good. Right. Mm -hmm. I do feel like they step on their dick a little bit because, you know, (laughs) Laurie Metcalf is the killer immediately. If you have any kind of attention span, you know that she did it. It's hard to accept that no one knows what she looks like. And then Mickey's just forced in. It's so it's such a weird thing because that should ruin the movie for me. But Scream is so clever and has these built in roundabouts that it mm-hmm. doesn't. And the fact that it's on a stage, I think, is the best way to wrap this movie up because it makes everything melodramatic and insane, right? Sydney's yes. life has become this, you know, weird story that, and she literally can't escape the stage, right? It's like the only stage that builds actual walls that you can't escape, right? And Sydney's in this kind of metaphysical, like, oh, my life is a bad play. I thought, I thought that was real, but that, I think it's, it's wild to me that that doesn't, ruin the movie for me in a way i mean i think that that's the strength of scream 2 in general yeah. is that it's a great it's it's funny like one of the first scenes the first scene we see randy meeks in is in his film study class where they're debating sequels and yeah. i mean what's fascinating is scream 2 is i think arguably i mean 
No, it's not arguably. Scream 2 is a great sequel to a movie. It's a great, great sequel, sequel to- but where do we rank it among horror movie number twos? I mean... Okay, so let's well, see. Halloween 2. What would you two. put in front of it? All right, Halloween 2? No, no, no. Halloween 2, I think... Not as good as Scream 2, right? So take Hall- I would agree. Friday the 13th 2. That's a close one. I really like what they did in Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th, I'd say, is one of my all-time favorite horror See, sequels. that like, one? Top Night- 3. Nightmare on Elm Street 2, I really like. Again, I love sequels that take me in weird, interesting directions, right? Uh, Evil Dead 2. Evil Dead 2, to me, is the top horror movie number That's 2 of That's top tier, time. I think. Hellraiser number 2, throw that out. Not very good. Leprechaun 2, fantastic. Pumpkinhead 2, not so great. Yeah. Right? Hostel but it's hard, 2. It, it's, hard, it's hard to top that first one, though. Yeah, but, I mean, that's what I'm saying. I think Scream is, to me, it's, in, it's is, in the class with Evil Dead 2. I Friday, think so, too, I, man. I think it's better than Friday the 13th Part 2, and I bet more people would say they like that over Nightmare 2. I think, for mm-hmm. me, it goes Evil Dead 2. And then Nightmare and Scream 2 are kind of right yeah, in that run. I'd say they're evenly matched, but yeah, I would Hellraiser agree. 2 makes me furiously angry to this day. Like, irrationally angry. Make me sense. mad. Make me want to throw Fiest mad. So yeah, I don't know I don't know what else I would put up there and just even horror. I know they mentioned House 2, the second story. I was like, wow, that's a fucking deep one. <laughs> Waxwork 2 is fantastic. I don't know how deep we want to go down this. But Friday the 13th. Actually, I'll two. say this. Slumber Party Massacre Part Two, where the guy's drill becomes like a Prince guitar. It's it's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> uh, Dawn of the Dead. Dawn of the Dead. Maybe Dawn of the Dead in the mall. I don't know. Yeah, that's what I mean. Though I think this is probably a top five. Yeah, an easy top five best horror sequel. It's pretty excellent. Yeah. Again, and if for a movie that literally references itself constantly. Yeah. Again, you shouldn't be able to do that, and you shouldn't be able to make it this good and this engaging as a horror movie on its own. Like, it should be a distraction that this movie constantly references itself, and it's not. And that is, again, like, that is the strength of Kevin Williamson as a writer, and that's the strength of Wes Craven understanding what he hath brought. Yeah, it's it's really cool because the whole thing is a puzzle box that just keeps saying, hey, it's a puzzle. So the whole yeah. time you're trying to figure it out while being a little bit – it's constantly just throwing red herrings at you and dissertations on what you're watching. And it just makes this perfect formula. And I think this one adds these kind of extra fun visual elements, right? The yeah. wild opening in the movie theater that's just like, well, what the fuck was that? The stage play Pretty is open. amazing. So there's some extra – fun beats in there right there is and one like, thing even, like this movie even has a moment like i got choked up when i saw dewey get get it and you're just like no and then you're like of course dewey's not dead but like oh what if dewey had died right there that would have like fucked me up man. my I, we didn't we didn't bring this up and i just really quickly like randy meeks's death is one of my all-time faves because he also has one of the greatest lines of this entire series when the killer asks him, what's your favorite scary movie? And his answer is showgirls. Definitely. Yeah. Right. That, <laughs> that might be one of my all time favorite lines in a movie. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, <laughs> I like, it might be one of my all time. That's favorite, another like, funny one because that was another jabs. great context clue. They buried yeah. in. Cause when he's walking in the road, he says, and don't even get me started on Billy, that fucking mama's boy. But, and that's when he gets dragged in and slaughtered. Yep. Totally. Like, Oh, we're doing Mrs. Voorhees. But that was like, Randy's death was, but again, this is just, there's almost a, an extra brutality. Oh, it's, which is weird because the first one, I think the kills were a little more big to where you can sever. You're like, wait, gutted and hung from a tree. Right. That doesn't feel as much as just like someone dragged me in and, shanked me right that feels more oh dude that happens all the time so i i just think this movie strikes such a fantastic blend and again to your point how they pulled it off again right it's kind of like paranormal it activity should right? be paranormal activity pony. has an amazing sequel too yes. but this is it's one of those with paranormal activity i'm always impressed i think it's one of the most impressive horror series and how does it keep working every movie's the exact yeah. same bag of tricks and it always worked on me every movie until they made the fatal flaw hey you know it'd be great in paranormal activity movies what if you saw everything 
And you're like, yeah. no, sorry, the like uh, fart cloud of demon is not as cool as <laughs> me being afraid of every corner in my house. Exactly. Yeah, I think I think it's amazing that Scream was able to pull this off so successfully in the sequel. And yeah, I think the sequel is just a, a tiny notch below the first one, and it's one of the best horror sequels of all time. Agreed. All right, guys, that's it for Scream 2, man. I hope you had a good time with us. Again, we're doing a horror movie every single day this month. So we will be back tomorrow with Scream 3. Uh, Ghostface goes Hollywood to, to yak it up with the Scooby-Doo game. <laughs> so that's uh, Scream Part 3. That'll be tomorrow. As always, take a second. Leave us a rating and review, especially on Apple Podcast app. Please, please, please. It helps us out enormously. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel and see our beautiful faces. Nerd Alchemist, plural with an S at the end. Uh, find us on all your social medias. Hit us up with your ideas for movie, movies you'd like to hear us talk about. Guest hosts, all that good stuff. Email the show, Film Alchemist Pod. Until tomorrow, I'm Josh Griffey. I'm Alex Dandino. <laughs> <laughs>